Well, welcome everybody. I'm Jane Julian and I'm the programming director for the Port Townsend Film Festival. This is our 21st annual event and it's our first virtual festival. I'm here today to talk with Christopher Smith, who is the director, producer, editor, camera person for Current C and an alum of the PTFF Festival. And with us also is Matt Blumberg, who's a subject in Currency, who's an investigative journalist. So um, welcome to you guys. And Christopher's in Los Angeles and Matt is in Cambodia. So it's kind of a wacky time difference for all of us. Thanks for being able to agree on a time and make it happen. All right. So I'd like to start off asking Christopher, how did you get your start in documentary filmmaking? I first started making docs probably in 2011 when I started filming my first feature, Tiny, a story about living small, which premiered, uh, sorry, which played it at Port Townsend back in 2013. And uh, ever since then, I've just been editing and working on a few projects and currency is the second feature I finished and I'm most most of the way through a third one. All right. And Matt, how about you? How, what's your interest in this story? In this story, um, yeah. I was working at, at a newspaper in, in Phnom Penh for a few years when I kind of came across this story. Um, uh, there's not, I guess there's not a lot of reporting that goes on uh, in the ocean, it, for sure, um, as there's not a lot of policing that goes on in the ocean. Um, and I, I was working at the at the newspaper and hearing little bits about crazy, crazy things that were happening at sea. And there's a lot of mad rumour uh, mills here that produce some really cool stories. So uh, eventually I had to go and have a look for myself to see how true all this stuff was. And when I went down and, and, and had a look around, I found out that it was even even more extreme and interesting and exciting than than I'd heard. Wow. So Christopher, why did you want to tell this story? What was it about it that grabbed you? You know, it's probably a lot of what initially drew Matt to it. I came across a story online that talked about Paul's work in MCC and particularly focused on the more I guess, violent confrontations that happened in the middle of the night. And I really wanted to, you know, take, try to find a story, an environmental story that kind of had that thriller movie quality to it as a uh, trying out a new way to get people to uh, take interest in a topic that might otherwise be dry, uh, which is conservation work. And so when I heard about what Paul and MCC were up to, I sent an email to uh, MCC's general info at you know, marineconservationcambodia.com and, and got a response um, and went out there about a, f you know, a few weeks later to take a look and actually happened to meet Matt when I was out on the island. Well, you had told me an interesting story about, maybe I should ask Matt this because he approached Paul initially. Well, I'm not sure who did it first, but Matt, can you refresh that story for us? Yeah, so I was, I mean, I was doing a lot of um, environmental focused journalism here the, about, like, firstly about the destruction of the forests here, and then kind of moved into, started hearing these little stories about what was happening in the ocean. Um, uh, it, it started with a story about a Cambodian fisherman uh, being killed at sea, which I, I found hard to believe, you know, um, so I went down to check that out. And then I learned about Paul. And then I was writing little stories about, you know, different little issues to do with conservation and, and touching on the Vietnamese coming into Cambodia. Um, and while using Paul as a source for these stories as, as a kind of marine expert, I was also trying to, I was always also trying to keep his story close to my chest and, and keep it for myself because as I learned more and more about it, I realized that how mad it was, how interesting and how unique it was. Um, so I was treading this fine line between trying to uh, write lots of stories about the ocean and, and, and begin to expose what was going on, but without attracting too much attention to it, which is a weird kind of line to be treading because I knew that 
I was the only person who had gained access to Paul and, and gained his trust at all. He's, he's not really fond of reporters or, or, um, or the media. Um, so yeah, I was, I, I, I eventually decided, um, this is mad. This is a, this is a, this is a movie. And I had no skill, um, to make a movie, but I did have a camera. Um, so I quit my job at the newspaper actually, and, and went down to the Island and said, mate, I want to, I want to make a film about this. This is mad. And at that time it was, a, it would have been a film about, um, a bunch of, you know, uh, hardcore dudes who hang out on an Island drawing tattoos on each on each other and then go out to fight with Vietnamese pirates in the middle of the night when they feel like it. Um, and then just by chance, yeah, I was, uh, I was at the Island and, and Paul told me that he had, had been, you know, contacted by this man, Chris and Paul kind of asked me, you know, what, what should we do? What should I do? You know, should I let this guy come or, and then I'm also thinking, Oh no, cat's out of the bag here's the story that I was going to tell someone else is going to come and do it properly because I mean, I'm, I, I didn't know how good Chris was, but I knew that it would be better than me. Um, and then luckily Paul kind of roped me in as, as I guess he kind of maybe in, in some way kind of used me as a shield to kind of be between him and this other kind of media entity that was Chris. And thankfully Chris uh, also, you know, saw value in in my my work and then i got to be part of telling the story that i had for so long kind of kept really close to my chest that's amazing um can you tell us a little bit about paul because he seemed to me and especially in that scene where you're kind of chasing him through the jungle and he doesn't <laughs> seem to want to talk to you and i assume that christopher was there at that time I mean, I was thinking that he reminded me so much of Colonel Kurtz in Apocalypse <laughs> Now. And he's, you know, he just isn't a warm and fuzzy kind of guy. So how did you win him over? What was it that you brought to him that made him think that, yes, I'm going to trust these guys? Um, well, Paul's from the other side of the tracks, you know, if you, if, if, if you can say like that. And um, while I present initially as a, as a journal, you know, I'm a journalist, which obviously scares a lot of people off immediately, but I mean, I can play other side of the tracks as well. Um, and I think, I think, I think I convinced Paul that I was, that I, that just that I was trustworthy and that I was interested in telling a nuanced story because, uh, one of the problems with journalists and journalism here in Cambodia is that there's 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 so many stories that uh it can be made into a quick sexy sensational big headline story and you get you know um what they call parachute journalists coming in all the time and and, and writing these sensational stories that really don't look at what's underneath and what's the real issue and I mean if you if you wanted to write the quick sexy sensational story about Paul's crew it might be that here's these ruthless vigilante thugs who are going out and, and, and beating up fishermen or, or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, but I think I convinced him that I was in for the long haul and, and also that I see, I mean, I see some value in the way that they, that they do what they do. Um, yeah, it, it was, yeah. It, it, so Sorry. go on, Chris. Yeah, go, I was gonna go, say, go. I think that's the, probably the, what I would say is maybe a big distinguishing point between journalists and investigative journalists is that, and documentary filmmakers, and I think that's what Matt and I kind of have in common, which is that you're more interested in spending time with the story and tracking it over time and trying to understand all of the angles and convey that through the story you're writing or, or making as a documentary. And, and um, you know, I think Paul probably had some prior experiences with just the parachute journalists or, or you know, normal journalists who just want to come in for a day because they're on assignment or whatever and write a quick story and, and or not even come in, you know, just go make a few phone calls and then write a story based on that. And, you know, in a place like Cambodia, you can't really do that. I feel like you have to be, have your feet on the ground and, and really going and meeting people and getting a sense of what the environment's like, what the people are like. And there's a lot of people who don't even have phones and who don't have a way to actually talk to the, the press both physically, but also just the access. And so there's just a lot more um, to explore. And I think that 
you know, Paul's open to the right kind of exposure or, or journalist. It's just that um, that can be hard to find the person who wants to tell your story in the right way. Yeah. Well, you had a couple other characters that were almost primary characters. And I was reading a story in the Washington Post a bit ago about casting for documentary films, which we don't really think about that, oh yeah, there's probably a casting process, but how did you find Vita and um, Roshana? Yeah, that was uh, sort of a stroke of luck, really. Um, and Matt, Matt and I met them, I, I think the same day, right? Because we it was when we went out to the island that, that one time. And uh, yeah. they were out there doing their master's thesis, honestly. And, you know, from the beginning of making the film, we were asking everybody, you know, given the conversation around um, race and in documentaries, sort of like white savior films that about, you know, people coming in and, you know, it, we were very, I was very aware that Paul is a Westerner doing this work in Cambodia and then Matt, who was the other main character as a Westerner doing work in Cambodia. And even though I thought that it was appropriate to focus on them because they had been there for the long haul, you know, mm -hmm. Paul's been there for more than 10 years. Matt, you've been there for like seven now or something, right? Six, seven. I did, um, yeah. You know, I, I was still just very aware that there, we wanted to put some, show Cambodians doing this kind of work. And it really is conservation work and reporting and things like that are, is very dangerous for Cambodians to do. And, you know, we looked around for Cambodian activists working in the ocean space and there just really wasn't very many of them. Um, they were either working with Paul or, were in jail or uh, the ocean just hadn't really broken through in terms of something that people were trying to protect yet. And so when Vita and Rachana, you know, came out, when we found out about them, they had come out to the island kind of against the advice of all of their advisors and parents and families and they learned how to swim so they could go learn how to scuba dive so they could study fish underwater. And they just had this um, perseverance and passion for conservation and learning about oceans and it just immediately caught my attention as people you know as like the future of Cambodia and, and, and to me that's what they represent and they represent this optimism and hope for the future there that um, I definitely wanted to work into the film and was looking for a way and then it was like aha yeah, like we're very lucky this happened. yes well, they were terrific. And um, one of the questions that keeps coming up with people that I've talked to about currency is their concern over whether you were ever in danger yourselves, both Christopher and Matt. And would you speak to that, please? Matt, why don't you? Um, well, I think if you're on, a, if you're on a, one of these boats out at sea and the boats are... Um, you know, sometimes trying to sink each other, uh, you're kind of always in in a little bit of danger. Um, yeah, there was some there was some scene, things that didn't make it. Some times that Chris wasn't there. I mean, Chris would fly out for weeks or months at a time at intervals. You know, over a period of a few years, and I was I wasn't there the whole time on the island, but I was also doing visits in between to 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 do my own work and also to keep up to date for the project with Chris. And there was definitely some um, hairy moments, like some kind of battles that, that uh, we were, you know, not involved in, but very much on the front lines of. And um, there's some pretty, pretty wild, pretty wild dudes out on those boats, you know, like the, I've seen, I've seen different kinds of weapons being used like Shanghai's machetes, um, even swords. Some of these guys actually carry swords um yeah I, i've seen some pretty serious fighting uh at sea and like you're, you're in an environment where you know you can't see land in, in any direction sometimes uh so yeah it's a bit, it can be sketchy how about you christopher yeah i mean uh, matt pretty much summed it up i think uh you know they're <clears throat> they're the other thing too is it's we're usually in the out there in the middle of the night most of the time and and mm. So it can feel really scary in the moment and then, and then nothing happens. And so afterwards you're like, I don't know, was I really in danger? I'm not sure. And it can kind of play with your mind a little bit. But in the moment, you know, when you hear boats all around you and you see lights flashing and, you know, 
it, you know, there, there were moments where I was sort of like, was this, a, was this a smart idea to try to make this film or not? I don't know. <laughs> um, but, you know, I think the real danger, I, I was less concerned about the fishermen than I was about potentially getting into trouble with the government at times. Because, you know, while nothing that severe would probably happen, you, you're just never quite sure that, um, you know, they, they have a lot of laws that they don't enforce, but they kind of are there to selectively enforce if they feel like you're causing problems. And one of, for a while, a big angle that we wanted to try to maybe explore in making this film was this, this angle of the more um, sort of immoral kind of corruption there, you know, not the sort of like average everyday corruption, but the, the, the actual government officials who were there, you know, kind of basically taking bribes and then trying to, you know, quiet anybody who might rock the boat. And, you know, we, we had discussed maybe um, tracking some of the boats coming in from Vietnam and like going and confronting people about why they aren't doing their jobs. And then we had kind of gone that route you know, could have been a little bit sketchier. We actually had a conversation about this one particular officer that we were thinking about going and confronting about why they didn't investigate the death of, of this fisherman. And then we really, I think ultimately kind of had decided that it was probably a, a bad idea in terms of our well-being to, to go that route. Um, who knows if it would have been that big of a deal, but, you know, we, we did have to have those conversations at, at certain times. Well, I think you really portrayed that even the Vietnamese fishermen were not really the enemy. I mean, they were just a victim of their own poverty that pushed them to try these other waters. And I thought you did a really good job of, of filming that aspect of it because it's really what's happening in so many countries that are poor. So, um, what do I want to ask you next? Well, just on that point real quick. Okay. Um, I'd also say that, you know, it's not, it, a lot of them are victims of, of the circumstance, but within, within every group of people, you know, there's people who are, um, are bad people and lots of people who are good people and are just doing the, you know, have a series of bad choices and are do, trying to do the best they can. And so there are certainly government officials that are just sort of like caught up in things that aren't really that bad. And there are, you know, fishermen who are um, desperate, but then there are other fishermen who are really bad. And, and so, you know, it, part of the difficulty is just knowing who's what and what you're dealing with. And when you're a foreigner trying to make a film or doing work in another country, you know, it, it's, you can get into trouble without um, realizing it just because you don't, you don't really know how to tell the difference, you know. Right. And additionally, there's a lot of the a lot of the guys that we're dealing with, the Vietnamese guys, uh, they don't even know what they're doing is so wrong. You know, they don't a they they, they pro probably don't know the Cambodian laws um, and B, they don't, you know, conservation and, and global fisheries and, and global fish stocks is not something that they have studied and, and are aware of. You know, they're just dudes who need to make a couple of hundred dollars a month to feed their family and do whatever their dad did or whatever their neighbors did or how someone told them, you know, this is how we can get a few dollars. So yeah, they, a lot of the time they didn't even, they don't even understand what they're doing, the, the consequences of what they're doing, you know? Yeah. yeah. And the bigger industrialized boats are typically owned by people who aren't on the boats. So they, they might have a, a fleet of boats or one or two boats and, you know, they, they might be aware of what they're doing is wrong, but you know, they're just hiring local boys from the village or whatever. Um, who are more desperate so right yeah well i wanted to go back a little bit to that not danger necessarily but the fact that christopher was with you matt filming in certain circumstances would you say that that impeded your investigating <clears throat> process or did it enhance did it help you to have a guy following you around with a camera um i think it, it, it it goes both ways. I think sometimes, you know, sometimes we would have to keep the camera, you know, hidden for a minute and kind of maybe I would go in and have a look about and, and see what the situation was and um, maybe work out what we were going to do before we come with the camera. Mm -hmm. um, but then sometimes the camera also in a weird way works to your benefit 
in that, as we're talking about, a lot of these guys who are working on these boats are just, are just guys from really, really kind of desperate backgrounds that um, probably haven't been to school and, and, and potentially have never been taught to, to question um, you know, they, they feel their place in the world is very, very small, you know? So if they see two, uh, two foreigners arrive with a camera and start looking around and, and, and this is also a bit of a skill that you have to have, you know, how do you present yourself and, and how do you, how do you move around? Uh, and if you kind of, you know, sometimes you move confidently and you move like you're supposed to be there, like you're allowed to be there then um, a lot of people, you know, they kind of just, maybe they just think, oh, gee, he must have spoken to the boss or he must, who, who is this guy? He must be allowed to be here. And they may be a little bit frightened to speak to you as well, because maybe they never saw a, a, a dude from Australia with a camera. So they're a bit like, well, what, what's happening here? Um, yeah, no, I don't, think it, I don't think it impeded us too much. I can't remember a situation where... Um, Chris, do you remember any, any times when the, when the camera actually hindered us? I mean, obviously there was times that we had to prepare how we're going to do this, but was there ever a time where we had to quickly um, get rid of the camera? Not, I don't think from the, the only thing I can think of is probably when we went to the shock village um, or Prechtonin. Oh uh, yeah. We, you know, they are a little bit as a village, uh, they're really tight knit and they're the ones that often fight with MCC and they know by and large that what they're doing is illegal um, because they've had big burnings of, of the gear that's been stolen on their pier before and stuff. And so they know that they shouldn't be out there with electric um, trawlers. So when we showed up with the camera, I think that they were pretty sure we were there not as tourists, because tourists don't go to that village. Um, mm -hmm. But in a lot of situations, you can, you know, most basically white people that Cambodian see are more than likely they're tourists or they work for an NGO. But you can really play that tourism angle up with a camera in a way that um, can work to your benefit. So, you know, we could kind of just make the camera as small as possible and, and pretend like we're over there just filming this cool village that we stumbled upon, like what we did with the seahorse village. And, uh, you know, no one really asked too many questions. But, um, you know, the more professional you look and, and, and if you're in places where tourists don't normally go, then that's, I think, when the suspicions are more raised. Um, but from a legal perspective, I'm pretty sure that I wasn't legally, uh, I don't know, I, I'm not sure if I'm supposed to say this, but I'm going to anyway. I, I don't think I was legally allowed to be filming in the country at all, because somewhere it's probably written that you need a permit. Um, sure. But e even though the, you know, I would just go up and film with officials and they would never ask like where's your permit or anything like that um but there's always that risk that if they don't want you filming them they can ask for that and if you don't have it then that can be a justification to kick you out of the country or take your camera or or even maybe even throw you in jail if they really don't like what you're doing so well matt i have one for you now um have you seen the film currency and if so what are your thoughts yeah i've seen it i've i've watched it a fair few times actually um i love it i think it's great i'm really really happy with um you know when you when you you stay in cambodia and you do do uh this for a living and then chris comes out and you get to work with chris for a couple of weeks or a couple of months which is always loads of fun um and then he goes away and it's like he takes the, all this material right and goes away and then i have no idea um what how 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 good it's going to come up and I, I i remember the first time i watched it actually and the opening scene just blew my mind i had <laughs> i had no idea that it was going to be such uh high quality such high production value you know it, it's it's great I'm, i couldn't be happier with it all right and you like it? <laughs> <laughs> so can you guys give me any updates on the people that you worked with say what's Paul up to, what are Vita and Rakshana up to, and Marine Conservation Cambodia? What's new there? I'll talk about Vita and Rakshana, and you want to, maybe Matt, you can talk about Paul a bit. Um, so Vita's book club was published by an NGO, and I believe they have uh, are working on translating into other languages, um, and maybe they already have, and I believe she's writing another book. <laughs> and 
she wants to be a little bit more on the um, writing and encouraging conservation work uh, in the sort of more like structural change sense, I guess, you know, more like winning, um, influencing people's perception about the environment and issues. And uh, Rachana is still on the island, still uh, working for MCC, but also kind of has stepped into that role as executive director and, and is really um, interfacing a lot more with, you know, the government and their, you know, nurturing their relationship and doing educational programs with the local villages, uh, with, the, with the kids and, and the fishermen to explain why the marine conservation area is there and how it's going to benefit them in the long term. And also just kind of running the, the normal sort of day to day operations on the island. I mean, MCC, since I've uh, met it and, and until now, I mean, now it's, it's just gone from strength to strength. They, they get uh, kind of more, more, more legitimate. I mean, not that they were ever illegitimate, but they be, they're becoming more mainstream and, and getting more, you know, they've got a partnership now with National Geographic and um, they've got scientists and, and, and students and divers coming from, you know, an increasingly wide kind of section of the world to, to hang out there and, and do their work. Um, and the, the MFMA is, is, is working. I mean, the fish populations are increasing. Um, and Paul is gone for now. I mean, MCC is still, you know, his baby, but he's moved to Thailand where his wife is from the South of Thailand and her family owns a heap of land down there that Paul and, and his wife and kids are now um, building a kind of um, zombie proof uh, post-apocalypse castle <laughs> to prepare to withdraw from society. And um, I mean, his, his kids are amazing. I mean, his kids um, know how to, you know, they, they'd be nearly able to look after themselves, those kids, in terms of growing their own food and, and rearing their own animals and, and then killing and cooking their own animals. Um, yeah, he's kind of, I mean, he, he'd spent years doing this work, which would absolutely wreck your head because of the way that he has to, you know, he, he knows that there's all these corrupt guys taking money, um, but he has to play this game with them. You know, he has to sit there and listen to them and pretend to uh, allow them to be the boss because they have the authority. And, and if he was to challenge their authority publicly, they'd lose face, which would cause all these, all these kind of problems. Um, so yeah. I think he's, he's taken a break. I think he did a lot of the hard work, you know, like he cleared out a lot of this rubbish and, and kind of established, got those, got those blocks out and set up the barrier at least and uh, made the government, I mean, he, it, a little game that he was playing is that the local authorities where his project is had for years been taking money from the fishermen uh, in order to, uh, for, for permission to do what they were doing. Meanwhile, he's got connections in the government in Phnom Penh and so he's playing, you know, telling the guys in Phnom Penh, hey, you guys are doing this. And, and I mean, they know, but they're also kind of obliged when someone brings it to light and someone who has a bit of credibility like Paul, because he gets invited to all these big uh, environmental days that the government puts on. So when he calls attention to this thing that's happening down on the coast, the guys in Phnom Penh kind of have to tell the guys on the coast, hey, you know, you, ha you can't be doing this, even though it's part of the a kind of a patronage, uh, a corrupt patronage system that has existed here for a long time. Um, so I think, yeah, he's having a rest. He, ne he needs a rest, uh, mm -hmm. having kind of cleared out all the muck and now got the kind of the, the, the nice front of an NGO set up to, to do the good work that they're doing. And he's yeah, got his feet up now. I, I just wanted to add to that because that's a really good point, which is that, you know, um, it's easy to watch a film and be like, oh, this is like exciting work and you know within 90 minutes they totally cleaned up that area and got a conservation area in. but you know Paul's been basically living on an island with no electricity no running water for you know 10 years <laughs> uh you know getting some making some progress and then getting knocked back a few feet and you know raising four or five kids um he actually has five kids one one actually lives in England now but was there for a while and so you know he just you know, in dealing with all these tourists, because they, they have this um, uh, volunteerism model where people will come and live on the island for anywhere from like a week to a few months or even a year. And, you know, so he's 
doing all of these things and it's always hot and humid and you know there's really nice relaxing moments on the island but also it's just a really stressful way to live for 10 years so um i i think he's probably yeah wants to to take a little bit more of a break but i i think he is building something like a the way you described it to me was like an eco um, sanctuary, uh, and eco maybe doing some eco tourism with the land there in Thailand. So I think he has a bigger vision that's still kind of in line with that fostering appreciation for nature. But um, I'll be interested to see what he does, you know, because he's also not the kind of person I can picture just sitting still and not doing them. Mm. Right. Right. Well, um, we're getting close to the end here, and I just wondered um, what's next for each of you. What have you guys got going? Chris? Mm, no. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm working on a, a third film, um, my third film called American Espionage, which uh, is totally unrelated to environmental issues, but it's a family story. So I'm um, excited to finish that up. And um, other than that, really just trying to get currency released to the wider world so everybody can see it, which um, by the time you're watching this might actually be a reality or very close to being a reality. So um, keep your keep your eyes out for a currency coming to a streaming platform near you in the near future. And a website maybe if people want to reach Yeah, out. the best the best is to just use Facebook and, and follow currency uh, there and it's currency uh, facebook.com forward slash currency film or currencyfilm.com. All right. And how about you, Matt? Um, I'm the pro one of the interesting things that I'm working on at the moment is a, a short animated film. Um, I work for the Thomson Reuters Foundation full time now as a, as a trafficking and slavery correspondent. And, and it's mostly writing and, and taking photos when possible. But I also get to work on little film projects every now and then. And this one is a, a short animated film uh about a vietnamese guy that i dug out who's a an investigator slash lawyer slash um undercover chinese mob boss um he goes he goes undercover into china to rescue women uh who have been trafficked into the sex trade um often held in brothels and and some of the women are also actually trafficked and then sold as brides um and this guy he he he's a a wild man. He's, I don't know. You could say he's like a Vietnamese James Bond or something. He goes, you know, he goes into these brothels and does these amazing kind of uh, extractions of women who are being held against their will. Um, and we should have that in the next month or two short film based on him. Great. I want to see it. Yeah. We'd love to have something more material from you. You are a budding filmmaker, Matt. So don't forget <laughs> us people in Port Townsend. We love your work. Yeah. All right. Cool. Good to know. Maybe I, maybe I get a leg up if I um, submit something to Port Townsend. Yeah. Or you yeah. can always submit it to me, and I can give comments on it if you need that. Would love yeah. It. I mean, I yeah, sure. I All don't right. have much. To, I've written the script. I've done the interviews with the guy, and then written the script for the film, mm -hmm. and then kind of handed over to a bunch of people who are. Uh, experts at what they do one of which is an animator and another one is uh, remolding and then taking control of my story but um, I've kind of gone mute in the process at the minute but uh, I'm sure it will still be wonderful all right that's awesome um, well, hey I'll ask this question I I saw I noticed the scene in which Paul was trying to communicate on his laptop with somebody from an NGO that was right kind of shining i don't know i don't want to say anything nasty but you know he was just shining him on a little bit and then the power went out and that just was so tragic to me can you speak to that particular incident it was an odd it was odd that um paul had raced back to the mainland for this phone call with this potential donor uh and the donor ended with Oh, that's great work you're doing. And I really wish there was some money that I had a magic pot of gold or something. He said like that. And so I'm wondering, you know, what was the point of this phone call in the first place? Um, and I mean, and, and it speaks a little bit to a point that uh, a message that I think the film, it, it, it touches on, but it, we didn't really get to drill into it. And that is the value of these um, grassroots kind of NGOs that Paul's is or has evolved from. 
uh, versus these massive corporate NGOs that exist uh, are plenty in Cambodia. I mean, here is a haven for NGOs and um, there's a lot of money that gets spent uh, in, in development and conservation work that actually doesn't go anywhere near developing or conserving anything. Um, these big corporate NGOs run on uh, multi-million dollar budgets and, and spend millions each year on conservation. And the big ones have been here for 20 years and more and are supposed to be protecting the forests and oceans, but the, the destruction has only increased on their watch. Um, and they have massive uh, staffs who earn big salaries and live in Phnom Penh in the city, live in nice gated communities, drive around in Lexuses, and maybe once a week or once a month make a, a field trip uh, out to the forest or the ocean that they're supposed to be conserving. Uh, and to be honest, most, a lot of them are clueless. They, don't, they, they wouldn't have a clue about what's really going on out there. And a lot of them don't want to because it's more, they don't want to get involved in this stuff. On the flip side, you have an organization like MCC that has actually gone and lived in the place that it's trying to protect. And that makes it a 24 seven job. And it also means that uh, you're gonna get your hands dirty, but the end result is what we've seen. They have actually made a difference. Whereas these massive commercial, uh, sorry, corporate NGOs that we all know of, the biggest conservation NGOs in the world have been here for 20 years and, and really managed to not get a lot done uh, mm -hmm. on the surface. It looks like, you know, they have all the, the, their websites and all their material that they share to show the world the, the change that they're making. But I can tell you that there's not a lot actually done. I mean, Cambodia's deforestation rates are amongst the highest in the world. And it's also one of the uh, most, uh, there's, there's more NGOs working on that issue here than most places. Um, so the, I mean, the, the MCC in Paul is a great example for like uh, getting down, getting dirty and maybe breaking a few rules and, uh, and not playing by the rule book in order to establish yourself uh, before then kind of growing into a more, um, I mean, it's not a corporate NGO at all, but it does have a, 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 a public facing kind of image that will attract more funds. And the good thing is that, you know, with MCC, those funds will be used properly. They're not going to pay salaries. Um, they're going to saving the ocean. So if someone was so moved by your um, explanation, who would you recommend that they reach out to? Um, I mean, you mean to help yes. to, to, to contribute? Yes. I mean, if MCC is pretty publicly accessible and if anyone wanted to, um, you know, support them, I, 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 I can say hand on heart that every dollar that you hand over will go in the right place. I mean, those guys live on an island in bungalows and they eat the same food every day and they don't have cars or fancy mobile phones. Um, they're living like on an island as if they are on almost, it's almost like a, it's almost like um, they're, they're living on the seat of their pants basically. And, and, and the money, all the money goes in the right places. So that is for the Marine Conservation Cambodia, MMC. Sure. Yeah. And MCC, Marine Conservation oh, yeah. Cambodia. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Easy to find. And I, and I mean, they're also, um, they're really busy, but also, they're accessible as well as in people can go and visit there. And if you were, you know, to want to get involved, if there's anyone who studies uh, marine biology or, or anything related, it's a great place to go and a, a awesome group of people to hang around with. Um, and it's beautiful at sunset and sunrise. And there's a bit of chaos with the fishermen in the middle of the night, maybe. Um, yeah. People are welcome right. there. Thank you guys so much. Yeah, Good luck, Matt. Thank you very much. Thanks for having us. Thank you.